Good afternoon or good evening or good morning if you're watching this when this comes out. Day of the protest tomorrow morning. The final one of the build-up to the final home game of the season, protest versus Brentford. I'm with a very good friend and someone. Uh, we're, we're doing it different. Rather than just fans, we've got uh, someone from the media. And as you can see from his... Uh, from his title and his name, it's Josh from Mouse Sport. Josh, how are you, buddy? I'm good. Um, pleasure to be on the channel. I mean, we've been meaning to do this for a really long time. Yep. I would just say off the bat, I am a Spurs fan and a season ticket holder, as well as someone that is a, a young journalist as well. So I'm not strictly, you know, in that media box. I am one of you as well. Oh, mate, you most definitely are. But it is good to have this conversation that we're going to have right now. So, you ready to do this, Josh? 100%. Bring it on. Right. Because people know I can get quite volatile and quite, I've made sure that I write these down with Josh so I don't put Josh in a position and I don't say something stupid, which is more highly likely. So, the first question we're going to ask you, Josh, and like I said, go into it as much as you can or what you can. Sure. How do you, as a journalist and the general media, perceive what's going on in N17? Well, it's a fantastic question because I think the simple answer is, depending on who you are, you'll perceive it differently. I think the overriding feeling, certainly from myself and from people that I've spoken to, from people that work at, at the Mail and work at other news organisations, whether that be Sky or, or the Mirror or whoever, is something is clearly not right at the football club. The club is directionless. And Tottenham once were a club that were going places, you know, aspirations of winning the biggest trophies in football, you know, twice came so close to winning the Premier League, got to a Champions League final. And then don't sign a player in over 500 days. Go through a bit of a circus in terms of a managerial merry-go-round. You get some huge names coming in. Jose Mourinho and Antonio Conte, you know, following up from um, Pochettino. I mean, these are names that Tottenham fans would only have dreamed of being able to yep. attract in the past. Uh, of course, we'll, we'll forget about Nuno because I think that you know <laughs> that's all I need to say on that. But um, <laughs> respectfully to, to Nuno. But um, clearly, Tottenham have not achieved the things that they and the fans, I suppose, all of us fans had hoped for. Um, and, and, and the clear situation is that, you know, there's been real issues with recruitment, yep. real issues with different managerial sort of tactical styles. Um, but fundamentally, the Tottenham fans are not getting entertained. You know, Tottenham are paying the highest season tickets in Europe. Yep. Um, you know, and there's been kind of questions over the atmosphere at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium in comparison to that older ground, you know, uh, at, at White Hart Lane, obviously, you know, and I, you know, as someone that grew up going to White Hart Lane, yeah. I completely can see the difference every match day. I mean, it, it's stark. Um, but fundamentally, I think what, what's going on is there has been too many mistakes time and time again at the football club. Uh, and that stems down from the chairman, Daniel Levy. You know, I think, you can clearly see, doesn't matter where you look, which news organisation you look at, journalists are calling out Daniel Levy, even Simon Jordan, who is a, you know, a self-proclaimed friend of Daniel Levy, yep. is calling him out and basically saying he's making some big errors here. Um, Ollie Holt, my colleague at the Mail, um, wrote a fantastic column. Incredible, about, Josh. Incredible. Uh, at kind of the state uh, of Tottenham Hotspur. And I think that that article sums it up best. You know, Daniel Levy is finally having to pay. He's been caught out. He's paying for a whole string of mistakes over a, a number of years where, you know, I like to, to kind of think back to the greatest who have ever done it. Sir Alex Ferguson, Arsene Wenger. Sorry, Spurs fans, but, you know, Arsene Wenger is one of the greats. Yep. You know, these are managers that when their team was on top, they would strengthen. They would get players out that needed shifting out. They would get new blood in and they would keep the squad fresh. Look at Pep Guardiola. He's doing exactly the same. And he is, you know, certainly in that same category. Tottenham haven't done that. 
Um, so I think it's all just a bit of a mess right now. And the way that we all kind of see it is, you know, and I think it doesn't matter if you're a Spurs fan or not, you know, and obviously I'll come into it with that angle because I am a season ticket holder, yeah. at the club, but clearly the club is directionless. And what everyone else is scratching their heads at is how on earth do Tottenham fix that? How do Tottenham keep the likes of Harry Kane at the club who without, you know, without a player like Kane, I genuinely believe Tottenham would be, you know, certainly at the lower echelons of the Premier League table, probably even in the relegation question. I, I genuinely mean that because his impact, I mean, to score 27 goals in this team, this season. Josh, just, just to stop you on that, if we took away his goals this season, we'd be 16th. That says it all. I mean, there was a stat, um, similarly, when... Arsenal had a Bamiang, which was that if a Bamiang hadn't scored his goals, Arsenal would have been 19th in the table. Yeah. That was a few years back, of course. And obviously, uh, his fortunes have completely uh, changed since, and Arsenal's, because both have gone in completely <laughs> different directions. But, um, and I suppose you can come back to that and say, oh, well, that's his job. His job's to score the goals. He, that's You could say the same about any team with their star striker. Few teams have what Tottenham has in Harry Kane. And I'm yet to see any real kind of evidence that Tottenham are, are serious about keeping Kane. Kane has come out and repeatedly said, match my ambition and yep. I'll stay and I will renew my deal. He's clearly uh, really, really in love with our football club. He loves the club. Look at the video today about the, the mural. I mean, getting his family's handprints, which I thought was really sweet. Incredible. On, on the uh, on the mural by Merwells, who's fantastic, by the way. He was on a Twitter space. Oh, it was brilliant, wasn't it? Johnny Hamm and, and, and Ian Lubin, just fantastically interesting. Um, but what I would just say is, you know, we've got the training ground. We've got the stadium. The only ambition I'm seeing, and I think the only ambition that many people are seeing from Tottenham Hotspur is the ambition to get the world's biggest names into that stadium. Yep. They're not football names. They're yep. musical names. They're Beyonce. They're Red Hot Chili Peppers. They're Wizkid. You know, <laughs> that, that Lady Gaga. That's not. Um, that, that's not ambition on the football pitch. And we are a football club. Yep. Uh, it's uh, it's easy to see why fans. You know, there are fans on Twitter changing their handles to Real Estate FC because that is how it comes across. So Daniel Levy and the board. And um, Joe Lewis at the owner as well, who is definitely someone that can't get away scot-free throughout all of this, have some real questions to answer. And this is a crossroads right now for the football club. And I feel like I've said this to you off, you know, off air uh, and probably for the last few months. And I repeatedly say this on Twitter spaces. Why is it that every transfer window is the biggest transfer window in the club's recent history? Why is it that we're in this situation that we're always at a crossroads? It's because clearly the hierarchy at Tottenham Hotspur Football Club have a different perception to what success is or should look like yep. and what ambition is to the fans. And I would also just say that, yes, I think there is a real situation going on where our expectations have been massively heightened by the you know miracle that Pochettino um you know fulfilled at the club which was to turn us from a team that was you know regular Thursday night football to Champions League and mixing it with the big boys going to Real Madrid and getting a result going to Barcelona getting a result you know beating European champions you know, getting to the Champions League final. I never thought I'd ever see Tottenham Correct. in a Champions League final. And yet we got there. I know we lost, but we still got to a Champions League final. Little old Tottenham. Because I think fundamentally, that's also one of the issues is, and I think this is something that is certainly perceived in the media. And, and fans won't like me saying this, but I do genuinely believe that many of us, me included as a Spurs fan, seems to think that Tottenham Hotspur is far bigger than we actually are, far more significant and important than we actually are. Of course, we're the most important thing because they're our football club. We yeah. love our football club. But in the wider 
context of of selling stories and news and kind of sports media, Tottenham's second rate compared to Arsenal, Chelsea, Man United, Liverpool, Real Madrid, Bayern Munich, Barcelona, PSG, to name but a few, right? AC Milan. You know, there are so many football clubs that take precedence. If a, if a player is going to leave Man United Football Club, Phil Jones, that's a far bigger story than Lucas Moura leaving Tottenham Hotspur. The only time Tottenham Hotspur is the dominating story is if it's Harry Kane, because he's a global superstar, yep. Son, because he's a global superstar, and people like Antonio Conte, because he's, again, a global superstar. Yep. You know, who cares if Tottenham are signing a player for the under 21s? Uh, so, um, Soups at Bell, for example. You know, who cares if Man United signing a player for that age range? We care because they're going to be potentially a player to play for the biggest one of the biggest football clubs in the world. Tottenham yep. Hotspur aren't in that boat. And I think that also skews our views somewhat. And that's me, you know, trying to be quite balanced on this but I think to put that whole spiel kind of into one thing it's a mess the media see this as a mess mm -hmm. journalists like myself my colleagues anyone who knows football or is following kind of what I would say are current affairs in football if that makes yep. sense, the day-to-day -day news of football can see that Tottenham are going absolutely nowhere and face a real situation where the likes of Aston Villa, Brighton, have, have that direction, that trajectory. Even Brentford have that trajectory, minus Ivan Tony's suspension. Yep. The clubs below us are starting to do this. Newcastle are doing this. And yes, of course, we've had you know Chelsea doing a bit of that, having a terrible yep. year this year. But Everyone seems to believe that I've spoken to that Chelsea could be title challengers next season under Pochettino. Agreed. There are going to be people that disagree with that, and that's fair enough. But fundamentally, even the likes of Arsenal, who are going to have a season without winning any trophies this season, even in their dark days, per se, the doldrums, the situation where they were doing what we're doing in the league currently, they were still winning FA Cups. What have Tottenham got to show for it? Absolutely nothing once again so it's a mess Daniel Levy needs to do something about it he's the only man that can do something about it you can't pin the blame on the players because if the players simply aren't good enough they're not good enough whose responsibility is that to ship those players on director of football can come in and take that role but we all know Daniel Levy is involved in that and Daniel Levy fundamentally is also involved in the recruitment of that director of football sporting director whatever you want to call it yeah uh, and that um, the, the kind of head of footballing affairs uh, in Scott Munn, who's coming in, that again is under Daniel Levy's watch. So, you know, all roads lead to one man, which is Daniel Levy. He's the man that holds the answers to these questions. If he doesn't have answers, then I think many Tottenham fans, you know, may disagree with this. But I think fundamentally Tottenham are at a point where something's got to give and perhaps it is time for him to step aside um, if, if he's not going to be able to answer these questions and handle these issues because either Daniel Levy steps aside or Tottenham Hotspur as a club with any credible chance of achieving anything remotely um, impressive or ambitious is going to be the thing that steps aside. And I know as a Spurs fan, what I would rather, I'd rather see the football club, you know, competing and going full pelt to try and achieve things rather than a chairman who's trying to achieve things when the football club isn't. So, yeah, fundamentally, I hope that's answered your question. It, it has, but you know what? Through it, you raised another one for me and I hadn't even thought about it or, or looked at it this way. So we're, we're going to have a little talk about it before we go on to the... Uh, the second one, and I love the way you you mirrored it or or you matched it about Arteta and Aubameyang. Now I've spoken openly about how Arsenal and Arteta said, "Get out these bad eggs, forget their contracts, off they're gone." But you look at it as you said, it was going Aubameyang like this, Arteta like that. 
They got Arteta out. Oh, sorry, Aubameyang out. Goes that way. The club listened to the manager. No matter who the player was, back the manager listened to what he wanted and said, okay, if this is what you want, you're the manager, you know best. Obviously, when, when Aubameyang, sorry, Arteta or any manager makes calls like this, it's on their head. It's like, if this goes tits up, this is on you, not me. You, you talk about the recruitment that we've had. You talk about, like you said, the players that have just been recycled and recycled. And like I said, again, you look down the road, they listen to Arteta. Aubameyang's fallen off a cliff. Arteta's stocks rise. But here, it's just the same old, same old, isn't it? The same mistake after the same mistake. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that that's one of the things that is really clear to see is that when you look at the Tottenham teams that I would say have underperformed or failed or achieved the same thing, not winning in cup competitions, having a chance to win silverware and coming short, there are a few individuals at that in, in our football club, in our squad still, that consistently played in those teams that had those shortcomings. Why is it that we're still having the same results with the same play with those same players? You know, at what point do you think, hang on a minute, is this not a pattern that's repeating itself? Right. Same players making the same mistakes, costing us the same results. And, of course, you can say, oh, well, Harry Kane was in that team. And Harry Kane didn't deliver in the big cup finals. He didn't deliver. It. Of course, that's true. But Harry Kane is also the reason why we're even in the conversation for these things in the first place. So, you know, and as much as we'd all love Harry Kane to be able to do what Gareth Bale did in that 2012-13 season oh. where it doesn't matter what, how the team was playing, he was going to produce a moment of magic and win the game by himself. You know, Harry Kane is a very different player to what Gareth Bale was. And Harry Kane is the biggest provider for his teammates and for the, the rest of the players, but he's also um, the one that scores the most goals. So we need to think about the players that are going to give him that service. Also, what about the players um, that are going to undo his good work? What if Harry Kane scores two goals and then, Eric Dyer at the back makes a mistake that costs two goals and that's the result gone. Or, or Romero, let's face it, Romero. Or recently, Romero. Could be anyone. I mean, I'm, I don't want to get on Romero's back too much because fundamentally he is a World Cup winner and he is very rash, sure. There's a lot of aspects of his game that he can improve on, but put him in a defensive line that is competent and I think he steps up to that plate as well. He's got a lot of potential. He's young. You know, yep. of all our defenders, he's the one one player that I look at and think he can improve and he can get better and better. And I tell you what, if, if Christian Romero improves, my God, have we got a player on our hands. But to just go to that Aubameyang point, excuse me, <clears throat> let's clear my throat then. <clears throat> God, something went down the wrong way then. Um, Arteta wanted Aubameyang out, even though he had performed so well he was turning up to training late. It was causing issues. I remember he turned up late um, for one of the games and he got fined and he got benched and it all kind of went downhill from there. Arsenal also brought in a superb director of football or sporting director in Edu, a player that played for the club, knows the club yep. and, you know, has amazing contacts in South America, amazing contacts around the world through his time playing football. And he's done a brilliant job. Then you have the Super League protests. And I think that's where things changed for Arsenal, because at that point, the board had to bow down to the demands of the fans. And from there on in, Stan Kroenke took a back step. Josh Kroenke took a step forward. And that marriage or that partnership between fans, players, manager, everything... Um, you know, it all came together. It all came yep. together. Tottenham haven't been ruthless like that. And I'm not talking about getting rid of Harry Kane, right? Because he's clearly not the issue here. But at what point will 
the club realised these players are an issue. We've got to get them gone. But then I suppose the other issue with that is we have also had managers that have consistently played Eric Dyer. Antonio Conte was very, very complimentary about Eric Dyer, as was Nuno, as was Mourinho. We all see Eric Dyer as probably the biggest problem in that back line by Hugo Lloris. Why is it that our perception is different, yet the people that really know what they're talking about on the training field have a completely different perspective on it? That's what we've got to question. And I suppose to a degree, you know, there is that divide between what the fans want and what the hierarchy at the club wants. But also, sure. I think it's conflicting managerial styles. And I think fundamentally, Tottenham fans want to see a team playing entertaining, attacking football. Uh, and, and have, obviously, to do that, you need a solid back line. And perhaps that's where there are, you know, for all the... the, the the greatness of having big names in the football club. Perhaps that's, uh, in hindsight, obviously, which is a beautiful thing, was not what the club needed. And and I suppose looking forward to who's going to be our next head coach. That's why I personally believe that Tottenham do need an Arnie slot or, or a, a coach who is not that big ego um, per se, where because we've tried the, the the kind of serial winners, the win now managers, we've not given them the tools to win now, and we've not won now. I mean, it's quite obvious. <laughs> so if we're going to go down that project route, you really do need to completely refresh, get the old guard out, bring new players in, who the manager wants, and you've yep. got to say, okay, it's going to go wrong for a couple of years, or it's not going to be pretty for a couple of years, perhaps. But if we can go and watch the team play and say, yeah, this team has given everything, absolutely everything, and they've had us entertained. Yeah, I had a good day out of the football watching Tottenham. We might not have achieved what we wanted to achieve, but we played some good stuff. We just got really unlucky with a 40-yard screamer against us. What can you do? I'd rather that than... The last four years. Fuck the life out of me again. Yeah. i do this to myself. Yep, but Josh, you know what? We're going to change the subject. I spoke, or we spoke, a lot more on that than I thought we were going to. So we've got one more topic before we get to my favourite topic. And I'm just going to let you go and talk for five minutes or you want. I'm not even going to ask a question, apart from the question I'm going to put on here. What do you personally think needs to happen at Tottenham Hotspur Football Club to turn our fortunes around? Fundamentally, the fans need to come together. I think that's a starting point. The fans need to come together with one common purpose. Um, I think we need to see alignment between the supporters' trust, the season ticket holders, your, your members, both in, in the UK and internationally. I know you spend the majority of your time in Toronto, in Canada. You know, yep. fans like yourselves in Canada need to be aligned with the fans in Stoke Newington, you know, and... I think it's time that the Spurs fans come together and voice their opinions. And I think that part of the problem is that the Spurs fans are entirely divided, which doesn't help the situation at all at the club. And I think every fan is entitled to their opinion. I'm not going to shoot down a fan that, you know, has a different perspective of, of mm -hmm. what's going on at the club, even though I won't agree with it. But fundamentally, you know, we've seen groups come together now and, you know, Fans want to see change at the football club. How are we going to bring about change if the board doesn't listen to the fans? Which is clear. We all know that that's the case. Yep. You know, and, and this is not, this is me speaking just as a fan here. You know, it's clear that the board don't listen to the fans unless they make an absolute racket. And I'm not saying do anything stupid or unsensible. But as a fan base, fans have to come together en masse. And I'm talking big numbers, not... 200 outside the, the club shop protesting. And, you know, I've got full respect for what you're doing. A completely Cheers, simple brother. Part of it. But if that's not how fans feel comfortable making their voices heard against the club, then we need to find a way to make them feel comfortable. You've just got the scarf there. You know, I've got one as well. Do you know what? I'll grab, I'll grab mine as go well. On, go grab yours, buddy. Go grab yours. I'll, I'll grab mine as well. And I think that fundamentally why I'm happy to support this is because 
it's a silent gesture. It doesn't require you Correct. wasting your time um, protesting out of a club shop or or whatever it may be. You know, you can voice your opinion in a silent way. Now, it's not for me to tell fans how to, you know, go about demanding change if that's fundamentally what Tottenham fans want. Because at the moment, I don't think it, we can say categorically that is what Tottenham fans want. Because if that's what Tottenham fans wanted, why is there this divide on social media, in the ground? I've seen fans fighting with one another yeah. almost to the point of over their views of the ownership of the club, over their views of, of, of how the club has fared this season and the direction of the club or lack of direction of the club. Um, and then I think fundamentally, that, that's kind of my bit on the fans and what the fans ought to do really, which is yep. come together fundamentally. Uh, either come together and accept that this is the way that the club is and just hope that we can go back to playing some entertaining football and if we're lucky, we might win something, but no guarantees, of course. Or, you know... You can you can call for change, but that either way it requires fans coming together on mass. Um, but then I think the second answer to the question, which is really important and fundamental, is what those who actually have the power to do something about the issues that the club face need to do. Daniel Levy needs to get this appointment of a director of football right. It needs to be spot on. We need someone to come in who has a proven track record of finding brilliant talent because it's clear that Tottenham aren't going to mix it with the big boys in terms of spending 250 million, signing players for 100 million pounds. Tottenham aren't going to do that. We know that. Tottenham are in that sort of secondary tier where you're not quite doing what Man City will do or what Chelsea will do, but you're in that kind of second category where you will spend money, a lot of money, on talented players, but if they're not the manager's first choice or second choice, exactly. you know, second choice because the first choice decides they don't want to join the club and what can you do then? Or too expensive. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to go and see Tottenham spend 150 million on, on, on Jude Bellingham. You're not going to see Tottenham go and spend that money on or, or crazy money on, on Declan Rice, right? So who can you bring in that the club can afford? Of course, the club can afford some of the top players in the world. It's not, you know, make any mistake over that. They absolutely can. The money is there. The FFP would allow them to do so as well. But we know that's not how Daniel Levy operates. So if you're going to do that, you can do one of two things. You can either join the oligarchs, the oil giants, the the uh, Middle Eastern states and uh, mega, mega, mega rich billionaires and mix it with the big boys. You can join that journey for the rights or the wrongs, whether you agree with the human rights in their country or or whatever it is, or the ethics of it, okay, fine. You know, and I don't want to go into politics. I want to kind of keep this to football. Yep. I think that's how the majority of fans feel, is they want to keep it to football. Yep. You either join them or you fall away. And the you only remember, way- Josh, Before you say that, remember, that's why we wanted to join the Super League, apparently, because we wanted to join with them before falling away. Yeah. So, you know, and, and and clearly the Premier League for me is the Super League. So I still believe the Super League will happen, just not involving English clubs. I think it needs to happen for the financial survival of, of some of the European giants. I mean, when you see, you know, we don't want to be in a situation where the Inter Milans and Barcelona's fall by the wayside because they can't afford to run. Yep. Or they go bankrupt or whatever it is, right? So... I think you've either got to put ethics aside and join them, and that involves a sale of the football club. That's the only way that can happen. Or Tottenham need to put a real strategic um, kind of step-by-step plan in place where you hire the very best minds and brains and pay the money to get them in. The likes of Paul Barber, who was once at the club, big Spurs fan, the best CEO in football, in my opinion, get people like him in on the money that they want, get the best scouts, get the best 
director of football you can possibly get and bring a coach who is also good at talent ID, plays the brand of football that fans want. And then Tottenham uh, have this expansive scouting network where they're doing what Brighton's doing and they're finding your Matomas for 2.5 million. You're in CISOs, you're Caicedo's, these incredible players, you know, that are now, in my opinion, you know, we're talking upwards of 50 million for these types of players. Tottenham can do that and hope a little bit like what we were doing under Paul Mitchell, you know, um, where we were signing talented players, not for the biggest money. Of course, the money in football's changed, but we were just scouting really well and yep. we were developing players. But again, there's no guarantee of success doing that. That might be enough to sustain getting into the Champions League every year, but that might, unless you supplement that with then top quality experienced players, you're never going to be able to reach those heights. But I think, you know, for me, fundamentally, I think that is the way Tottenham need to go. Tottenham need to appoint the very best people behind the scenes, get their scouting up to scratch, you know, find the best talents in Wood Green, in Walthamstow, in Enfield, in Chigwell, and not look to Hemel Hempstead and Hampstead Heath and Epsom or wherever. Mm -hmm. The boys on your doorstep is what we need, right? The talent. And not let them go to Arsenal to Luton, to QPR, to West Ham, you know. And then on top of that, you've got to be finding the best young players from around the world. I mean, Julian Alvarez, £6 million. Mitoma, £2.5 million. You know, these players are game changers, right? Yep. And, and, and Man City know that the second that Haaland leaves the club, which, you know, it seems written in the stars that he'll end up at Real Madrid at some point, no, look no further. You've got Julian Alvarez who can step straight into that mould. He comes on, he scores almost every time he's on the pitch. Yep. You know, So Spurs need to be doing that. And then we know Spurs have the money to buy top players. So sure, find those gems for cheap. Bring a manager in who knows how to play an attacking brand of football, entertain the fans, but also has that talent ID thing, which is why I'm really keen on Arnie Slot then supplement those talented players with that £85 million centre-back that you need that's going to be an absolute game-changer, the way that Virgil van Dijk was for Liverpool. Sign that goalkeeper for £65 million, £70 million, if it's going to be one of the world's best, the likes of Mike Magnon, for example, the likes of Gvardiol. Of course, Gvardiol's not going to join Spurs <laughs> now, and there's a calibre of player that won't join the football club because we've simply not achieved what other big clubs have. Correct. You know, that's the way I see Tottenham turning things around, a combination of those factors. And then either the club has to sell to, you know, to bigger money. Yep. Or you have to employ the right people. And I don't think personally that's going to be possible with Daniel Levy having the level of control and input that he has on footballing affairs. You know, and as much as I am not a fan of Daniel Levy in terms of his, his judgment in football knowledge, football judgment, he's made a lot of mistakes. I think many Tottenham fans would happily accept Daniel Levy still at the club if his role was strictly uh, that of a commercial role. You know, sponsorships, getting concerts in the stadium, as many avenues for income that's going to benefit the football club. But Tottenham fans and the team is yet to see those benefits bear fruit. You know, we've seen a lot of avenues for uh, investment into, into Tottenham, into the club, into the stadium. But has that gone on the team or has that gone straight into the pockets of, of the owner and the board, you know, that remains to be seen. And I think that's that lack of knowing is creating a lot of animosity, but fundamentally, as I've said, those factors and, um, and the fans coming together uh, with one real shared voice of, of wanting to see that change. Well, let's have a look. So, I mean, listen, I'm not even going to pick this up for much longer. I'm not even going to go in. I'm just going to say, listen, I've spoken about it every day. I'm going to have a, Two minute thing, then thank Josh for his brilliant time, which I know is uh precious to him and making the time for me. So, listen, we've been speaking about it all week, it's been everywhere all week. It is the final game of the season. Myself, 
Boogie, Ryan, Graham and some others will be there from 9am tomorrow opposite the club shop, getting the banners out, getting everything ready. We have said to everyone, get there for 10 or from 10 onwards. But get there when you can. If you get there earlier, get there earlier. Like Josh said, if you do feel that protesting is the way, come, come over, see that we're not... Uh, causing mayhem or, or, or disruptions. We're, we're, we're protesting peacefully, apart from obviously chanting what we do. And topless rabbis this time. <laughs> yes, I, I don't believe he'll be there today. I don't believe he'll be, he'll be going to the game, but the rabbi won't be joining us inside, uh, outside today. Um, at time of recording, this is obviously Friday, but tomorrow this will be going out. And yeah, listen, this is the final game of the season. We, we, we're all home game. This season hasn't lived up to its billing. It's been another disaster. Like Josh said, we're going into another window that is the biggest of Spurs' recent history. And it needs to stop. We all want a successful Tottenham. So if you feel the way we do and you're coming to the ground, come and stand with us. Josh, I want to thank you for your time, buddy. I Any really time at do. all. It's been a pleasure coming on. Can I just say one thing? You um, can, brother. I would just kind of... You know, and it's not for me to preach to the Spurs fans at all. I think that I'm the last person that people would, you know, want to listen to. But I would just say this as, a, as an observation from the things that I'm seeing on social media, which we know can be a volatile place. Whether you want Daniel Levy or Enoch to remain at the club or whether you want them out. As Tottenham fans, we fundamentally want what's best for the football club. We want a winning football club. We want to be entertained and feel value for money when we go and watch the football. The Tottenham Hotspur Stadium is an incredibly toxic and volatile place. I don't want to be seeing Tottenham fans attacking one another, having fisticuffs with one another, often because of too much of that. Whether you agree or disagree with fans protesting outside the club shop, whether you agree with Brian and Billy and Boogie and Rachel, or whether you don't, respect everyone's opinion and allow others to express themselves the way that they wish without getting on each other. We're all on the same team here. We're all Spurs fans. We all love our football club. I don't want to see any more of the infighting. I think that's been the thing that's been really quite shocking to see. And I yep. think fundamentally, that really does hinder the ability for our football club to make those strides forward. Is that infighting? Is that right. lack of fans coming together and, and supporting one another? You know, be safe if you do go to the protest tomorrow um, and, and be safe if you if you are coming to the game tomorrow. Hopefully I'll see some of you there um, at the game. It's the last game of the season. We still do have Europa League football to fight for. Fans will vary in their opinions of whether they want Europe, don't want Europe. I still want Tottenham to win every football match. I still want Tottenham to finish as high in a, a position as possible with as many points and as many goals as possible. I'd quite like to see Harry Kane get to 30 goals and break his, uh, you know, the record for his the most goals that he's scored in a single Premier League season. I think he needs, he's four off of levelling 31, which I think is his best. So I'd like to see him score five more before the end of the season. Brentford, no Ivan Tony, great opportunity to get some goals there. You know, let's go and win those last two games. And, and let's get behind the players. You know, it's not the players' fault that we're in this situation uh, as a football club with, with, you know, next to no direction. Of course, there are players that aren't good enough. It's going to be the last uh, outing for a number of, of players. I, was I actually had a tear in my eye watching the video of Lucas Moura um, saying goodbye to the Tottenham fans and thanking us. A lot of Tottenham fans getting on his back because he's not... Uh, performed as well as he once did. This guy is a cult hero for us. He gave us the best night of our lives um, for those, well, for those of us my age. Some of us who have seen us win bigger trophies might say different, um, but certainly the best night in my life was seeing Lucas Bora 
get that winning goal at Ajax. You know, let's give him the send off he deserves. Let's give some of the players that may, you know, never play for Tottenham Hotspur at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, whether we've liked them or don't like them. Again, let's give them the send off that they deserve. Let's thank them for their service for the football club, even if it is the likes of, uh, uh, I'm going to get shot down for this, but even if, for example, Eric Dyer was to leave this club in the summer, I would still have, you know, kudos and respect to a guy that has played for a number of years at our football club, whether I think they're a good footballer or not. <laughs> I don't think it's their fault that they're not very good. Um, yeah, let's get behind the players tomorrow is what I would say. Let's stop attacking each other. Let's come together, get behind the team and up the Spurs. Up the Spurs, but also I will say, if you are going to direct your your, your frustration at anyone in the stadium, there's only one man to do it to. It's not the 11 players on the pitch. It's not anyone on the touchline. It's someone sitting on the halfway line in the West Stand in a very comfortable seat. Um looking emotionless. So if you're given any fr- if you're given any frustration, that's where it should be headed. Josh, a pleasure. His Twitter handle is always get this wrong, right there. Always a pleasure, Josh. We'll speak soon. Everyone, make sure you like, comment, share, subscribe. And as always, Levy out. <laughs>